Gary Gerstel, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you for having me. I'm stoked to have you on the show. So I told you very a little, just a little bit of how much I enjoyed your book. Uh, one of our previous guests, Rana Faruhar, has called this an instant classic. I was looking for a way to describe it. I think that that was better than anything else I was able to come up with. My description was more convoluted. It was one, you know, I studied political science and economics in college, and I, this would be for me uh, an important book to be on any syllabus, any introductory course to American political economy, American history, uh, et cetera, th those types of subjects, because it isn't just a, a book that I enjoyed reading, especially the parts that I lived through, because I lived through the 1990s and the 2000s, and I was a student studying these topics in the early 2000s. So it was actually especially wonderful reading through that. But I think this book is particularly useful for young people, people who are teenagers and in their early 20s who are trying to understand the last 100 years of American history, even if they don't understand that that's what they're looking for, as a guide to how to face the challenges that are coming before us, which is where I want to ultimately take this conversation, Dr. Gersel. But before we start, uh, and before we start discussing this latest book that you've written, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, tell us a little bit about you. What's your story? How did you get into becoming a professor? What do you teach? And, uh, and what got you interested in writing about the various themes that you have written about throughout your career? Well, I've had a long career as a historian. Uh, this is my 42nd year uh, teaching history. I've taught at multiple institutions, including Princeton University, Vanderbilt University, University of Maryland. Uh, 10 years ago, I decided I had an opportunity to hop across the pond. I am an, I am an American, as your listeners will readily hear. And I got an offer from the University of Cambridge uh, to go teach there. And uh, England, Britain had been a formative moment for me in terms of my intellectual development. I spent a junior year abroad when I was in college at the London School of Economics, and that was an extraordinary year for me. And that's when I began to think about becoming a professional historian, which to me means reading, researching, and writing history, teaching history. And uh, I have been committed to that for four decades now. The uh, immediate impulse for writing this book were the two extraordinary events of 2016. First came Brexit in June 2016, and then came the ele election of Donald Trump in November 2016. I was an American living and working in Britain, so I felt the impact of those two events equally hard. And I, I did not welcome either Brexit or the election of Trump, but more deeply, I wanted to understand how two events that had been so unimaginable in the 1990s and first decade of the 21st century not only became imaginable, but had occurred. If you had talked to Brits in the 1990s about the prospect of Britain leaving the EU, they would have told you it's never going to happen. And anyone who followed Donald Trump in the 1990s, as I did on the tabloid pages of the New York Post and the Daily News, would have said this man could never be a serious candidate for president of the United States. Uh, so I thought the two events were in some ways connected, although I didn't understand entirely the connection at the time. And writing the book was my effort to understand how two unimaginable and unexpected events had actually occurred. I wanted to tell the story of how America had gotten to this point, and I wanted to illuminate it with a historical perspective, and I wanted to do it in a way that um, would not issue easy opinions, um, and and in which I would wear my own political sentiments on my sleeve, but get to a deeper historical understanding of what was going on in the United States, what was going on uh, in the world that could produce the events that occurred in 2016. That became the motivation for uh, writing the book, The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order. I didn't, it's interesting that you say that you wore your political views on your sleeve. You didn't, I'm paraphrasing a bit there. I did get a sense of your uh, political perspective. We could put it that way, but it didn't, it wasn't like a, it wasn't 
it wasn't it didn't dominate the book. I, I think for, for the most part, at least my reading of it was it, it felt very historical. And and the parts that I lived through and studied myself, extremely accurate and clarifying. So for what that's worth and for anyone out there who might be triggered by your statement. <laughs> um, so what let's let's talk about the breadth of the book, because it isn't just about the neoliberal order. You devote the first two chapters to the New Deal order, which you wrote a book about published in 1989 by a similar title, The Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order. Let's kind of zoom out a little bit here. What are we talking about when we talk about a political order? What is a political order? What constitutes it? How do we define it? Well, the concept of political order was an idea that my co-author, Steve Fraser, and I introduced in our 1989 book, The Rise and Fall of the New Deal Order, which surveyed American politics from the 1930s to the 1980s. And it was an effort to uh, rethink political time. And what do I mean by rethink political time? So much energy and focus and attention in the United States is focused on the election cycle, the four-year presidential cycle, the two-year off-year elections, the every six years elections to the Senate, uh, the senators having to undergo re-election. And as we can see, as as we move in uh, to an, another election year, 2024, so much energy and focus uh, gets devoted to uh, the players in the particular election, who they are, uh, what they're saying, as if uh, everything in American politics can be understood within election cycles, two, four, or six years. The concept of political order was meant to help us understand political developments in America that cannot be understood in two, four, and six-year election cycles, especially in terms of political economy, especially in terms of core ideas of how to build a successful uh, economy. Uh, these are ideas that develop over much longer periods of time. Uh, and we wanted to understand how that kind of conception of politics could be useful in understanding American society. A political order is a story of a particular political party um, being very successful at the polls, uh, winning consecutive elections, uh, having a level of organization in terms of lobbyists, interest groups, constituencies, uh, think tanks, uh, an ideology that becomes dominant and paramount. We were interested in understanding how certain kinds of political formations, the one we were studying at the time was the New Deal, became so popular and so dominant that they extended over election cycles and then over decades. The New Deal order was a political formation that arose in the 1930s and dominated American politics until the 1960s. Uh, and we wanted to understand how these political formations arise, how they gain and exercise power, and how they fall apart. We did this with the story of the New Deal, which we said was not just a political movement of the 1930s and 40s, but a political formation, a political order that dominated American politics from the 1930s to the 60s. And when I came to write The Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, I applied the ideas of political order developed from this earlier book to a subsequent period of time. The neoliberal order I wrote in my book was something that arose in the 1970s and 1980s, acquired dominance in the 1990s and first decade of the 21st century, and then fell apart in the 21st century. Uh, at the core of each of these political orders was a certain kind of approach to political economy. Uh, under the New Deal, uh, the core idea was that capitalism left to its own devices was destructive, chaotic, producing uh, too much uh, uh, economic inequality, uh, too much disparity between the rich and the poor in American society, producing a business cycle that no one was very successful at managing uh, in terms of easing out the highs and lows and the, con and the conviction arose amidst the Great Depression of the 1930s that capitalism could no longer be left to its own devices. Uh, 
it had to be managed by a strong federal state in the public interest. Uh, what is most interesting about uh, to us about the rise of this conviction is that it not only dominate, it came to dominate the Democratic Party in the 1930s and 40s, but it came to dominate the Republican Party as well. And the true test of this was in 1952, Dwight Eisenhower is running for president on the Republican ticket. There has not been a Republican in the White House for 20 years. Uh, you might think that a Republican uh, confronted with a strong federal state built by the New Deal and the Democratic Party to manage capitalism and the public interest, you might have expected a Republican to have dismantled the New Deal, to roll back the big state, to free the private entrepreneurial energies that capitalism can generate. And yet when Eisenhower wins the election in 1952 and comes into office in 1953, he does not dismantle the New Deal. He preserves the welfare state. He preserves Social Security. He preserves taxation rates, the highest marginal taxation rate of 91, 92 percent on the highest income earners in the U United States. He allows labor, which had gained considerable power, organized labor under the New Deal, to retain its power. He acquiesces, in other words, to the core economic principles of the New Deal. And it is at that moment that the New Deal went from being simply a political movement that had been very successful for several elections into a political order. And the test of a political order is whether a set of beliefs about political economy developed by one party become so popular and so dominant that they compel acquiescence by the opposition political party. The Republicans felt in 1952 and 53 that they had no future but to acquiesce to the core principles of the New Deal. When I came to write the story of the uh, rise and triumph of the neoliberal order, the key decade of triumph is not the 1980s when Reagan was president. He was the architect of the neoliberal order. Uh, the key decade of triumph occurs in the 1990s. And the question, uh, the most interesting questions of the, of the 1990s is similar to the question that confronted Eisenhower in the 1950s. Eisenhower, the first Republican president to come into office in 20 years. Bill Clinton, the first Democratic president to come into office uh, in 12 years. And because the Carter presidency had not been very successful, one has to reach back even further in time to find a successful Democratic presidency. After a furious decade of, of neoliberal policymaking under Ronald Reagan in the 1980s, the question became, will Clinton undo the neoliberal order that Reagan was establishing, or will he acquiesce to its core principles? And the argument in the book is that Clinton acquiesces to the core economic principles of the Reagan revolution. And at that point, I suggest the very powerful political movement that Reagan led uh, becomes dominant, so dominant that it uh, influences policymaking, not just in the Republican Party, but the Democratic Party as well. Clinton acquiesces to the neoliberal principles of the Reagan presidency. And it, it is at that moment that a political movement becomes a political order, giving it um, hegemony, power, authority, legitimacy over all of American politics, essentially then from the 1980s until the second decade of the 21st century. So that is when neoliberalism became not just an ideology, but the ideology that uh, authorized and legitimated a political order that dominated all of American politics. So one of the, um, the things that comes up often in the book is this recognition that the larger social currents, technological, economic, political forces in society are ultimately the primary actors driving events. So you brought up Carter and Clinton. It's, there's perfect examples because Carter, as you point out, was not – he in some ways, he was uh, neoliberal curious. Yeah, He flirted with many of these ideas. He wasn't entirely sure what he was grasping at or what he wanted to – you know, focus his policy attention towards and may that that may have reflected 
the fact that these policies, these New Deal policies were no longer working the way that they were expected to work. And I think even more obviously in the case of Clinton, Clinton came in with, a, I think, a different set of policy ideas. Of course, he also had Robert Reich as his labor secretary. And then with the uh, electoral loss in 1994, he pivoted and became much more supportive of these types of neoliberal, um, this sort of, again, I, I don't know exactly how we would call the, this neoliberal agenda or whatever word you want to use for it. In other words, the 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 these 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 leaders were it's not that Clinton or Carter came in and they imposed their will on society. This is this reflects really the dynamism of American society and it, and it also comes up for me when we talked about when you were talking about the New Deal order which is the New Deal wanted to to exercise control over the economy. I'm sure some of that came from the fact that there was a, a a rising interest in managerialism as a result of the industrial revolution, but also the fact that it was addressing a cataclysmic depression. And similarly, in the 1990s, there was a sense of government needs to be more distributed. It can't be big. It can't be this lumbering giant. We can't have our hands everywhere. We need spontaneity. You know, Hayek to to quote Friedrich Hayek. So it's it's just it's interesting, and I just want to point that out because um, we oftentimes. Uh, lose sight of of the fact that in in an economy and in a political economy like ours, it's so dynamic, and we oftentimes expect so much from our leaders, but so much of it is really the currents of of society. Uh, an important question for you about the New Deal order: uh, What was the the moral argument and perspective of the New Deal order that legitimized it in the eyes of the people, and how did that differ from what the uh, neoliberal order became? Well, the 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 New Deal came to power under Franklin Roosevelt and the Democratic Party in 1932, and then again in 19 won the reelection in 1936, 1940, and 1944. The Great Depression was the worst economic catastrophe in American history, both in terms of depth and duration. Uh, Twenty to twenty-five percent of the workforce out of work, one third of the people having poor housing, what were called Hoovervilles in all kinds of cities, um, people making houses out of cardboard or corrugated metal, whatever they could get their hands on because they could not afford even a minimally decent place to live. And there was a sense that uh, capitalism had failed and also that a great deal of irrationality was built into the system. Quite a number of farmers found it was more difficult to uh, drive their hogs to market than it, than, than it was to sell them at market. In other words, they were getting so few pennies on their investments that they decided to kill their hogs. And so you have a situation where uh, all these people are going hungry in cities and farmers are destroying livestock because they're not getting any revenue for it. And this uh, sense that capitalism had become not just an unequal system, but an, an irrational system that made no sense. And you needed some kind of institution to come in and um, humanize capitalism, um, regulate capitalism in the public interest. Uh, the New Dealers were not socialists. They did not want to concentrate all property into the state and run things from the center, but they understood that in order for capitalism to survive, it had to be regulated by a, a powerful um, federal state uh, able to establish a welfare state to cushion the experience of those who were the casualties of the economic system, and also a system that redistributed wealth um, and power from the rich to the poor so that many more Americans felt that they would have a stake uh, in the economic system that America had. Even during the Great Depression, everyone recognized that capitalism was an extraordinarily powerful system for generating wealth. But the conviction settled in the 30s that it could not distribute wealth to enough people to generate support for this system over the long term. Uh, and so the core moral perspective was that capitalism had to be regulate, regulated for the sake of giving people decent opportunity, a decent amount of security, so that they could uh, 
pursue a good life for themselves, the kind of life that America had always promised its people. In the process of doing this, Roosevelt defined or redefined the meaning of liberalism, liberalism in the classical sense, as under, if we are to understood, understand it by Adam Smith, the Scottish philosopher and political economist of the 18th century, who was so influential. What he meant by liberalism was removing all the impediments to trade and exchange and enterprise so people could truck barter and exchange as they saw fit, remove the heavy hand of the monarch of, of aristocrats who were not earning their living, let people just be themselves free in economic exchange. This was the meaning of liberalism in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and the idea was that if you free people from constraints, uh, they will flourish and they will un they will experience uh, an unprecedented level of freedom and liberty understood both economically to do the things they wanted to do and understood politically that they would have a voice in their own governance. Roosevelt in the 1930s redefines the meaning of liberalism and what he, and, and so it becomes the synonymous with the New Deal and, and the Democratic Party. And he says it's no longer enough to make people free from the constraints of government, because if you do that, they're going to become victims of the capitalist system. What he says instead is that it's the job of the federal government to give people enough security, economic security, enough opportunity in terms of education, enough power at the workplace so that they can negotiate decent wages with employers. Uh, and the goal of all of this is to get them to the point where they no longer have to worry about every meal and they no longer have to worry about whether they're going to have enough to um, support their family. And only under such circumstances of a government-regulated capitalist system will people be able to enjoy their liberty. What is liberty if you don't have any food? What is liberty if you don't have decent housing? What is liberty if you have no if you don't have a pension in your old age despite having worked a lifetime? What is liberty in those circumstances? That's nothing but counterfeit liberty. And so Roosevelt says, we're going to make it so people can really enjoy their liberty. And he says, this is the 20th century meaning of liberalism. So it's no longer, liberalism no longer means freedom from the state. Liberalism means a state acting to regulate capitalism in the public interest so that many more Americans can enjoy their liberty. This is what liberalism is meant to be. This becomes a very a moral story. Uh, the Roosevelt administration and the New Deal giving a lot of Americans the kind of security, the kind of opportunity, uh, the kind of educational advancement, the kind of rights at the workplace that positioned them to really cultivate their individuality. This is a 20th century meaning of the word liberalism, liberty, and freedom. That was at the core of the New Deal story. The neoliberal story is just the opposite. And some of your listeners may wonder, wondering, maybe wondering, what is neoliberalism? Uh, it literally, neo is just an, a fancy word for new. It's new liberalism. It's quite similar to the Adam Smith liberalism of the 18th century, but they could not call it liberalism anymore, even though they wanted to, because liberalism was now a term that the Democratic Party and the New Deal had appropriated. So they call for a new liberalism, and it resonates with 18th century conceptions of liberalism. They looked on American society in the 1970s and 80s, and they saw a very large federal state that was malfunctioning, that uh, was not delivering in terms of economic growth, that was not uh, managing the economy in ways that created sufficient jobs for the Americans who needed them. And so the core ideology and the core moral story that someone like Ronald Reagan tells is that we will make America American again by eliminating this large state, which is stymieing capitalism, stymieing investment, stymieing innovation, uh, the job of the neoliberals, as they saw it, was to free capitalism from constraints so as to encourage 
a kind of 18th century style individualism of initiative, innovation, uh, generating new industries, generating new technologies that would create a new economy that would not be hampered by regulations imposed by a large federal state. So the goal of neoliberalism becomes to remove the federal state from the economy, to free the animal spirits of capitalism from constraint, in the hope and expectation that this would bring freedom and liberty to ever larger sections of America. So the core story that the neoliberal order told is really the reverse and the opposite of that which the New Deal order had tried to popularize and for decades succeeded in doing. So classical liberals were very concerned about concentrated power, but they identified that power in the form of government. In the 19 in the early 19 late 1800s early 1900s we saw the rise of private concentrations of power. How did uh the public's and the and the Roosevelt administration's conception and the progressive movement writ large conception of of concentrated private power inform the moral dimensions and the moral arguments for the new deal order that arose how how important was that and is that is that well enough understood today do you think i think the uh, anger at private concentrations of wealth that first emerged in America in the late 19th century, as you suggested, and gathered steam over the first three decades of the 20th century is not something that we fully understand today. Uh, although there is growing anger in the country at the power of large corporations, it still doesn't match the anger that was abroad in American society in the first two decades of the 20th century. Uh, the, the most powerful argument uh, that was launched in favor of uh, limiting the power of these corporations was rooted in the Constitution of the United States and the first three words, we the people. This was a country in which the people were meant to be sovereign, uh, in which the political institutions of the United States could express the will of the people. And the will of the people, as it was being increasingly expressed in the early 20th century, was that pr private concentrations of economic power had become so large uh, that uh, the people were no longer in any meaningful way sovereign that was they were no longer uh in charge of their own country that the constitution had in some important way uh been violated as was the promise in the declaration of independence uh to give people the opportunity to pursue life liberty and and happiness so the uh the critique of private economic power was couched in patriotic terms that uh, that a country that prided itself on making the people sovereign had to do something to curtail the power of these private institutions that had released themselves from popular control. Uh, and this becomes the powerful animating force of populism, of the 1890s, of progressivism in the first two decades of the 20th century, and of the New Deal itself. Uh, the language that Roosevelt uses in the 1930s, he, he calls the, the private centers of economic wealth malefactors of great wealth. He calls them Tories, a reference to those who remained loyal to Britain in the uh, Revolutionary War. Um, he, uh, he says, uh, we must strip them of their power as the Minutemen stripped the British Empire of power in the 1770s and 1780s. He draws directly on the founding story of the American Republic to drive home the point that 
this kind of concentration of wealth and power was a kind of tyranny that the American Revolution and the writing of the Constitution was meant to eliminate from American life. Now, the tyranny that the revolutionaries were most concerned with was political tyranny and the modification of that story that Roosevelt makes in the 1930s is to say, we no longer have to fear political tyranny, we have to fear economic tyranny. Uh, and our heritage, our founding moment, the Declaration of Independence, the Re American Revolution, the war for freedom from Britain, the writing of the Constitution, this can guide us in terms of establishing a uh, republic that uh, eliminates economic tyranny as successfully as America had eliminated political tyranny in the 18th century. And this becomes the story that Roosevelt and the New Dealers tell. They couch it deeply in, in patriotic terms that they are standing up for what is best in the American Republic and for its most cherished values and symbols. Yeah, this uh, this conversation about power and the transformation of power, the sh it's how it 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 changes its shape, um, is something I want to talk about in the second hour when we discuss the new order that's coming into being now and what some of the challenges are that the the public is grappling with. But before we do that, I have one more question, which has to do with communism. So communism was a sort of grand ideology that attempted to grapple with the forces that we're talking about today of industrialization and the new consumerism uh, in a more uh, sort of uh, from the ground up sort of way. The Bolshevik revolution was in, uh, in 1917, and there was a real concern about the appeal of communism in the United States. How did that force communism and its success in the revolution, in the Bolshevik revolution of taking over Russia and turning it into the Soviet Union, and the appeal that uh, that uh, political factions of the United States had towards it, the the appeal of it. How did that inform the policies of the New Deal and the willingness of the political class to push those types of policies forward? Well, I treat the communist revolution in Russia in 1917 in the book as arguably the most important event of the 20th century. Uh, the conviction at the heart of communism was that capitalism could never be reformed in the public interest, that it could never be made more egalitarian, that it could never redistribute its wealth su successfully to broader portions of the population, that it was a recipe and a formula for misery for the masses, deep exploitation. And so the communists said that uh, capitalism had to be eliminated and had to be supplanted by a radically different system in which there would be no more private enterprise, that all economic activity would be run by the state theoretically by the people, but the wrinkle of communism is that the people weren't ready to manage their own affairs, so they needed a vanguard party, which they called the Communist Party, to act on the people's behalf. And a, the dictatorship of the proletariat, which is how communists themselves defined it in the short term, was justifiable until such a time as ordinary people acquired the requisite consciousness so as to understand where their true interest lay. Uh, Communism also believed that capitalism being a worldwide system could not be successfully eliminated unless the cause of communism was made international. It was not enough to establish communism in one or two countries. It had to be a global revolution. And this is what made communism in the eyes of many Americans so dangerous because communism was an existential threat to America. America celebrated capitalism free enterprise, private initiative, small government, seeing political, seeing tyranny as emanating from political rather than economic sources. Uh, America was the home of 
the strongest private enterprise system in the world, communism said that in order for us to triumph, we have to eliminate the capitalist system, which, which has had its greatest power in America. And the communists had a lot of influence in ways that we have trouble understanding now because of the reasons that we have been discussing earlier in the podcast, that capitalism was generating a lot of inequality, that it was generating a lot of misery, that it was not successfully redistributing a sufficient amount of its wealth to a large enough portion of the population. So in the 1930s and 40s, there are many Americans drawn to communism or some version of socialism, believing that perhaps it is true as the communists claim and as socialists claim that the capitalism the capitalist system could not successfully be reformed, that Roosevelt was doomed to failure. And so this is a powerful force uh, in American society in the 1930s and 40s and then it becomes an even more powerful force after World War II, um, when much of Europe had been destroyed, where it's clear that the two most powerful countries in the world after World War II are the United States and the Soviet Union. And this is not just a battle between big states, this is a battle between ideologies, because America is the home of capitalism uh, and the Soviet Union is the home of communism. And the two societies, in terms of ideology, are sworn to each other's destruction. America comes out of World War II, on the one hand, a big winner. Its economy is, has recovered, finally. Uh, it, is, it has demonstrated a great capacity to, to, to produce wealth. Uh, it is the only industrial country left standing intact because so much of the rest of the industrialized world had been destroyed by the conflagrations of World War II. So on the one hand, America is poised to dominate the world. On the other hand, there's the Soviet Union, which had its own feats of production, which had its own heroism associated with World War II. Uh, and which is going to many countries emerging from the failing empires of Europe throughout Africa and Asia. And it's saying to them, you will not get a fair shake if you go with the capitalist world. You will only get a fair shake if you go with the communist world. And if you think that America is serious about freedom and liberty, let us ask, let, we will ask you this question, we meaning the communists, how does America treat its African-American population? Mm -hmm. Those living in the Southern states are living in conditions of unfreedom, not that far removed from slavery a hundred years earlier. America promises freedom, but it's a counterfeit freedom. You, the peoples of Asia and Africa, you are people of color. You share the hues of color of those in the United States. You see how America treats its people of color. If you opt to go with the so-called free world, you will be sign signaling a willingness to endure and suffer at the hands of a country that is not just capitalist, but privileges the lives of whites over the lives of non-whites. The Soviet Union and communism takes this message to many countries in Asia and Africa. Many of them have communist movements. Many of them have national liberation movements. The most, the best known in the United States, of course, is Vietnam, North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, where America fought a bitter war that it lost. And so the question that arises in the United States is um, how do we confront this communist menace? How do we fight for the allegiance of countries uh, in Africa and Asia where the populations are people of color? And the answer that America increasingly gives is that America has to reform its capitalism. It has to reform its racial practices so as to obviate the worst. And America, both 
public leadership and private leadership of corporations become so fearful of communist triumph in the world that they agree to compromise with their antagonists in American society in ways that they might not otherwise have been willing to do. So employers agree to compromise with the labor movement at their workplaces. Uh, a serious civil rights movement in the United States gets the kind of support that it would not otherwise have received in the 1940s and 1950s. And what I argue in the book is that the pressure exerted by communism on American capitalism and on American policy inclined elites to compromise with their working class antagonists in American society in ways that they would not otherwise have done. They agree to share a greater portion of their own profits and wealth with the workers in their factories. They agree to support uh, a social welfare state, pensions for the elderly, help for the disabled, welfare payments for mothers with children without male, breadwin male breadwinners present. They are the elites in American society are willing to take on these sorts of compromises because they feel they need to do this in order to avert the worst, which for them means communist triumph abroad and God forbid communist triumph in the United States. So communism has a, um, uh, has a moderating effect on American capitalism inclining these powerful centers of private power that you referred to earlier, inclines them to compromise with their opponents in American society in ways that they would not otherwise have done. One measure of this is uh, the gap between the rich and the poor in American society. Uh, in 1960, a CEO at an American corporation made approximately 20 times what an average manufacturing worker in that enterprise made, 20 times more. That's a significant multiple. By 2000, after communism had failed and disappeared from the world, the ratio between the average CEO's salary and the average worker salary has ballooned to 300 to one. There is a wage compression between the rich and the poor in the decades of the Cold War. Uh, that uh, reduces the levels of inequality, economic inequality in American society to their 20th century lows. And this, I suggest, has to do with the fact, not just um, that America had a powerful labor movement, but that elites in American society were willing to compromise because they feared the communist menace. They saw it as an existential threat to the American way of life. And in order to preserve the American way of life, these kinds of compromises had to be made. By the same token, the failure and the disappearance of communism from the world, and I say that knowing that China still formally considers it a itself a communist society, but it's not. It's a Leninist society, and we can, in, in terms of its authoritarianism, mm -hmm. we, we can return to that theme later if you want to. But it's not communist in any meaningful sense of the of the word. The disappearance of the communist threat from the world has emboldened these same American elites so as to be much more reluctant than they had been to share their wealth, to share their power with the less fortunate in American society. So the rise of communism and then its subsequent fall uh, has a lot to do with the political story in America that I have to tell. Both the success of the New Deal, when the communist menace was real, and then the success of the neoliberal order once the communist threat had been eliminated from the world. I love that you brought up compromise. I'm going to stack that right up there with power. Um, and I think those two things go together. And... You know, I, I this is informed by a sort of Hobbesian state of nature view of what we are attempting to constrain with government. 
and in tempting to protect ourselves from when it comes to the concentration of power in government. And I, I think I absolutely do want to talk about how the fall of the Soviet Union informs where we are today because of how it changed the incentives towards compromise, how it informs, in other words, how we've ended up with the political system that we have today um, and also the state of our economy. I, I want to make sure that we get into the conversation about the the rise of the neoliberal order. Before we do, I just want to make an observation, and then we'll get into the decline of the New Deal and the origins of the neoliberal order, because those two, two things uh, happen concurrently. Is it just fair to say, quick uh, question, is it fair to say that LBJ's administration was kind of the apex? It was the crescendo of this order because it it involved the Great Society, which was the the attempt to really instill in, a, in an almost sort of idyllic form, the ideas and the aspirations of the New Deal in terms of legislation, economic legislation, civil rights, also something I want to just emphasize in case people didn't notice it. I think what you were suggesting was communism was also an additional incentive. The, the appeal of communism was an additional incentive to try and address the civil rights issues within the Democratic Party, even though the white South was an important constituency. And in fact, in retrospect, the civil rights compromises on the part of the Democrats cost them the South and subsequently uh, led to a, a Republican administration in 68. And then Vietnam also, which was the sort of all of these things, I guess my point is they 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 are informed by the international competition with the Soviet Union. Vietnam, the outward push against communism, civil rights, the need to find class compromise, and the great society to address economic concerns in a way that is sufficient to offset the appeal of communism so that you don't have to go down that road. Would you generally agree with that, that that was the sort of apotheosis of these policies? Yes. I, well, I, I, it's the apotheosis of the New Deal order, and also it's it's when the cracks in the New Deal order become too large to cover up. So it's both uh, apotheosis and overreach. So talk to Any... me, let, let's, yeah, let's talk. So talk to us about the origins of the neoliberal order, where these ideas came from, how they came into the, the margins of society before they went into the mainstream in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, and how that coincided with the decline of the new deal order in the 1970s, where it became so obvious that it wasn't working. Well, neo the neoliberal order, the neoliberal ideas uh, were not new in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, the key architects of neoliberalism were Austrian economists like Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, uh, who had developed their ideas as early as the 1920s in Vienna and 1930s. Uh, they subsequently left Vienna and Austria when the Nazis rose to power and that became a long period of exile for them in Britain and the United States. Uh, and they were diligent about spreading their ideology and acquiring followers most prominently in an organization they founded that met annually in Switzerland, the Mount Pelerin Society on Mount Pelerin and in Switzerland. And so they had annual meetings and they had a devoted following and they were particularly strong at a certain number of institutions in Europe and the United States. London School of Economics is one example in Britain, the University of Chicago in the United States. But for most of the 1950s and 60s, they were utterly without power and influence. And this included even the man who becomes the most popular banner carrier for neoliberalism, and that is a man by the name of Milton Friedman, who is associated with the Chicago School of Economics and becomes at a certain point in the 1970s and 80s, a household name in America. Uh, but what's interesting about this group of people who want to free capitalism from its constraints, and they want to get rid of strong centralized government because they see nothing good in it and don't believe in the possibility of planning an economy, regulating capitalism. They want to free the animal spirits of capitalism to, 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 to do its thing. They, they are incredibly strong believers in free markets, but they have no purchase on politics in the 1950s and 60s when the New Deal order is riding high. 
Uh, and when I uh, talk to young people ab about this, they actually, and these people tend to be more center left than center right. They actually find inspiration in how dedicated these neoliberal theorists were to staying the course over a long period of time in which they had no influence at all in American politics. And their opportunity comes to move from the margins to the mainstream in the 1970s. And there are um, several developments that are um, breaking apart the New Deal order. And I'm very interested in moments when political orders break apart because in such moments, ideas that were regarded as radical, heterodox, unworkable, consigned to the margins have an opportunity to flow into the mainstream. And that's what happened with, with neoliberal ideas in the 1970s. The New Deal order is beginning to break up over racial issues, as you suggested, over Vietnam in the 1960s. But then comes the economic crisis uh, of the 1970s, which in my telling of the story is the coup de grace for the New Deal order. And there are two changes in the global economy that really hurt America at this time. One is the reappearance of other countries that are industrial competitors to the United States. After World War II, the US is the only industrial economy in the world left standing after the destruction and carnage of World War II. And it has the world economy pretty much to itself in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. It can do what it, want, what it wants. But the US is also rebuilding Europe. It is rebuilding Japan and other countries in East Asia. And suddenly in the 1970s, Japan and Germany reemerge as very serious competitors to the United States. And American corporations have get, gotten, a lot of, gotten a little soft in terms of their dominance of the economy. Uh, and they thought that conditions of little competition would persist forever. And suddenly they are confronted with these younger, more energetic, more technologically advanced industries in Germany and Japan. Think of automobiles, think of electronics. Those are the two leading sectors. Uh, think of steel manufacture. And suddenly these become serious rivals to the United States and corporate America is not prepared for these challenges. That comes, that rivalry comes from the global North. And then there's the challenge from the global South because the global economy that the US had uh, rode to preeminence was a cheap energy economy based on the flow of endless amounts of cheap oil, much of it located uh, in the Middle East. And until the 1970s, the flow of oil and the pricing of oil was pretty much controlled by Anglo-American petroleum companies uh, and increasingly uh, these countries uh, were getting angry and uneasy about this Western control of their reserves. Uh, and there's a Arab-Israeli war in 1973, the Yom Kippur War, uh, where Israel calls on the United States to resupply it with armaments. It is shocked and surprised by the attacks on it by Syria and Egypt in 1973 and feels it can only survive with replenish supplies of armaments from the United States, which the United States agrees to deliver, at which point Saudi Arabia in leadership of OPEC makes its first really successful intervention in the global economy. It simply shuts off oil shipments to the United States. Uh, gasoline prices quadruple overnight. Uh, there's not enough oil to go around. America's uh, petroleum economy is grinding to a halt. A compromise has worked out, but the quadrupling of oil prices, which had began, begun in 1973, persists and then is, is given another uh, vast increase in 1978 during the Iranian Revolution and the over, overthrow of the Shah of Iran, who have been a close American ally and another major supplier of oil. The Iranians hate the United States, the ones who are coming to power. They also shut off the flow of oil to the United States. Uh, and so America had gotten used to having no competitors in the world, having endless supplies of cheap energy, and suddenly it has massive competition, and suddenly it's paying a lot more for oil.
And this plunges the American economy into a long and severe recession in which things that economists said could not happen were happening. For example, the inflation rate and the unemployment rate rising at the same time. There was no explanation for why this was happening. And the tools that the New Deal order economists have been using, a tool of, of Keynesian formulas after uh, John Maynard Keynes, the, the great theorist of what federal governments can do to control economies in the public interest, they are no longer working. America has plunged into economic crisis. It's a long crisis. Uh, economists are not being very successful at uh, addressing this, this crisis. And this is the moment when the neoliberals who are, are in the margins, who have no purchase, where their critique of a federal government that's become too powerful, too regulatory, does not seem to know what it's doing. This is when their critiques begin to bite. And this is when those voices on the margins saying we must free, we must shrink the state, we must free capitalism from its constraints. This is the moment when neoliberalism has an opportunity to rush from the margins into the mainstream. You said at the beginning of our conversation that Jimmy Carter is a Democrat who ambivalently explores these ne neoliberal ideas. That's a that's an apt characterization. One day he embraces them, the next day he renounces them. But Ronald Reagan, who's going to be his opponent in the 1980 election, has no doubts about the superiority of free markets, free enterprise, freeing capitalism from the constraints of state tyranny. And when he is elected, uh, this gives neoliberals an opportunity to flow right to the heart of the corridors of power and uh, economic policy in the United States. That's the moment when neoliberalism ascends as a political ideology governing the economics of America. And that's where I want to take us in the second hour, Dr. Gerstle. Uh, the Reagan administration, the fall of the Soviet Union, the political coalition that came together in the 1990s uh, of the interesting bedfellows between the left and the right, that led to the compromises of the of the Clinton administration, Bush and the rise of neoconservatism, and where that folds into the larger neoliberal order, the decline of the order under Obama, and then where we are today, and if we can begin to flesh out some some contours of the new order that's emerging today, what can we say about it? Where are the areas that we've already seen uh, uh, consensus, and what are some areas where we can see something coming together so that we can begin to think about what it might look like going forward. For anyone who is new to the podcast, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Dr. Gerstel, head over to hiddenforces.io and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Dr. Gerstel, stick around. We're going to move the second hour of our conversation onto the premium feed.